Hi, welcome to The Bridge Podcast. The podcast deals with post-contract management and the relationship between the customer and supplier. I'm Nick Francis, your host for today, and I'm the Chief Technology and Marketing Officer for Brooklyn Vendor Assurance, and I'm also a Board Advisor to the Vendor Ops community. It's my job and privilege to guide you through this complex world of the buyer, customer and supplier equation, helping provide you with some insight along the way. Every week, we look to provide you with an interesting guest from either the customer or supplier side to help understand a topic of discussion. This week, we'll be talking about how to navigate gaps in your operating model when transitioning from pre to post contract that seemingly no CRM, P2P or S2C tool or platform will help you with. Our aim for the podcast today is to hopefully from our speakers, you to gain understanding and get some guidance from years of experience in the field, dealing with complex organisations and complex contracts in the supplier and buyer journey. Today, there's two guests with us. The first one is Richard Hibbert. Richard is a commercial leader that has worked on both sides of the equation on both the buyer and supplier side and remains focused on how to drive an optimised business value. Richard is the VP of Loculus and the founder of Business Performance Limited. I'm also joined by a colleague of mine, Colin Woodford, who is a financial services veteran who's worked up to sea level in some of the UK's largest financial institutions and highly regulated industries. Colin is currently the Director of Customer Success and Operations at Brooklyn Vendor Assurance and is the Managing Director of Astute IT and the Co-Founder and CIO for Reg Risk Technology. Vendor Ops, levelling up your vendor management. Before we get into the podcast, it would be great to understand a bit more about who we have here with us today and understand how they arrived at this point in their collective careers. So we'd like to hear from Richard and Colin themselves. Gentlemen. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, I'm Colin Woodford. Delighted to be here today on The Bridge. Yeah, my background, I started out uh, in consultancy uh, many years ago, and it was with Pricewaterhouse, accountancy, consultancy. So it gave me good insights into the financial aspects of, of service delivery. From uh, consultancy within Pricewaterhouse, quickly found the, the financial markets. So 25-year veteran in financial markets, working with the big investment banks, JP Morgan, UBS, HSBC, Barclays, and always had an interest in business value and accountancy. So how do we maximize the value from suppliers and from services within organizations? So that's really led me into how we're here now within Brooklyn Vendor Assurance. So left the um, investment banks, did a lot of work around cost optimization Running service delivery was always key to understand what you're paying your suppliers for, how you can work in partnership with the vendors to get a good service, drive maximum value, drive transformational change, drive that success working together, business, suppliers, vendors, and other partners working together to create this uh, this change. From there, setting up a consultancy, drove through cost reductions, understanding the cost base of many more organizations, legacy services, new services, driving that transformational change through, and then working that through to make sure that we could deliver value for money at a reduced cost. Started a consultancy working with Nick, and that uh, introduced us to Jesse Lee, who's the CEO of Brooklyn Vendor Assurance. We wanted to bring some of the findings that we'd done through the consultancy into Brooklyn Vendor Assurance. So a lot of the best practices that you'll see within Brooklyn Vendor Assurance take those best practices and and digitize them into a, into a platform. My current role is to lead customer success within Brooklyn Vendor Assurance. And I love the role, working again with suppliers, with vendors, with our partners, our clients, our customers to deliver that, that success. Average day for me working within that organization is talking to, most importantly, our customers. What are they looking to drive? How are they working with their suppliers to drive that through? Um, How can we embed transformational change, make these changes that are going through, you know, the world's changed so much in the last two years. Everyone has changing the ways of working. I think we went through a a lull in in two years But now we're seeing more digitization, more people looking for rationalization and driving that through. So working with our customers to understand that, working with um, the services that we consume um, within Brooklyn Vendor Assurance, making sure that we can deliver on on our excellence uh, and providing good value. Current focus, top of mind, a lot going on. We need, we know where we're going as a a country, as a global economy. We're going into a changing state again. We need to make sure that we can understand the complexities that go on within within the whole organization, within the world, understand those complexities, work closely together, 
And we're coming into a new era now. We're coming into a way, a new way of working. Uh, and we need to make sure that we can work collaboratively and, and drive that through. Um, that's top of mind for me. Looking forward to the session. So Richard, thank you for joining us today. Uh, it'd be great if you can give us a bit of an overview into your background and some of your early days in your career and uh, what you've been up to more recently and what's top of mind for you at the moment. That would have been easy if you hadn't said early days, Nick, I think, because they're a long, a long way back now. But the early days were, were involved in uh, an early career of flying that I stopped and moved into the world of, of technology with uh, NCR back in the day. And, and very interesting, even then, selling data center services, which we call cloud services nowadays. So IT doesn't change that much, but grew up through selling hardware, fantastic companies like Amdahl that took on IBM in the plug compatible mainframe fields, and then moved into the worlds of software and services with uh, another wonderful company, FI Group, which became Zansa, which is now Software Stereo Group. But, uh, FI was famous for the ladies who set it up, and I was the sixth man to join. So I, I learned about diversity, and I learned about how well ladies run a business long before many did. So uh, my, my career really took off in, in outsourcing for many years, and there was an interesting turning point. I, I did a very large contract with the Bank of Scotland, and their treasurer asked me to, to join and set up a service company within Bank of Scotland to sell out to their organizations and their, and their customers, their major customers, uh, which led me on to a career in banking for about 15 years of my entire career, um, moving from Bank of Scotland to Barclays. And I was doing M&A work and major transformational work there, which taught me an awful lot about the buy side of the life, of, as opposed to the selling side that I'd been on. But I, I missed the fun of selling. So after Barclays, I, I went over to the wonderful chaps at BT and carried on doing global work selling, outsourcing worldwide. And then I ran, B, ran BT's Global Services Transformation Program for two and a half years, uh, at which point I had no hair left at all. So that's where the profile <laughs> comes from now. And then since then, I've been very much involved in small businesses um, in Loculus, the company that I, I jointly run with with Alistair and Mark now, which is, like yourselves, very successful software business. But I've been involved in a lot of consulting work for major PLCs and small organizations. Um, and over the last 10 years, a great deal of that's been around contracting and commercial management. So it's, it's been a fun career so far. How have you found the differences? So you're a rare individual for us to have on this podcast that's done both sides of the, the fence, a buyer and supplier, but also scale. So biggest organizations down to the smallest organizations. What could you say is similar in terms of your experiences, depend, independent, irrespective of what side of the table you're on and what's, what's different about that? There, there, there are many things that um, are similar. The differences are relatively easy to put my finger on. The, the focus on value, the focus on cost, the focus on budget, the smaller the company, the greater that is, unless it's a careless business. Mm. They know the real value of cash and they know the real value of outcomes. They're also asking, relatively speaking, for smaller commitments in terms of scale. So those commitments are easier to manage. Yeah. However, as a proportion of their income, what often they're committing is so significant to the future performance of their business that if it goes wrong, that's terminal. Mm. That's quite different to your major PLC that could have in quotes, nobody wants a program to fail, but you can afford for a program to pause or to fail. And in the major PLC, their, their buying will be more rigorous and, and more process driven with slightly less focus on the value of cash. But there's some very common areas and many of those come down to phrases I use such as willful blindness. You know, people sign the contract and then forget about the important parts of the contract that lead you to the value. Yeah. And I've seen that in global banks and I've seen that in 200 people, small technology companies. Um, equally, I see people spending too much time worrying about the quality of liability management, conflict management, uh, governance, mm -hmm. and not thinking about how well they're designing the obligations to actually deliver what it is they're trying to buy or designing their milestones well. And I, I summarized it recently, talking about graphically the image of a bow tie, that any of these organizations 
approach together with their potential vendors down one wing of the bow tie, getting closer and closer through their buying RFP process or their sales and bid process, mm. to the point that you're in a very intense, right in the not in the middle legal conversation, a very expensive conversation. And then strangely, from day one after signing the contract, consistently, they start moving apart. Mm. And over the years, I've seen that proven, not only it's not a country thing, it's not a cultural thing. I've seen it in China, I've seen it in Turkey, I've seen it in America, and I've seen it here in the UK. And I made the same mistake myself. You mentioned the stat before we started recording that was the 20% mark, oh, sorry, the 20 months. Yeah. So, do you want to explain a bit about what that was in that context? Yeah, so there was an interesting study done um, probably five, six years ago now that was looking at outsourced contracts and major transformational contracts. And the lead question was, what leads them into a point of stress or failure? And at what point does that happen? And the average point, trigger point, was about 20 months into the life of the agreement. So when I was working with ING, looking at their global performance um, commercially, we'd looked for that very telltale point. And sure enough, we found that in the first three months, people were doing very little to understand the, the, the value drivers and, and other elements of the contract they just implemented. They were thinking more about organization, about incepting the, the projects or the programs. They were thinking more about communications. They would then start to break out the detail of the contract, but not, not in a very dynamic way. And very soon they'd find it fragmented into data parcels that are all over the business. HR would have a singly, singular view, finance would, technology would, the business units would, but there wasn't a collective view any longer. And the supplier was doing the same thing. We'd find major suppliers on complex programs would then be breaking what they contracted to do out to several divisions of their, their enterprise. And again, they're losing sight of the core value that the contract was designed to deliver. You've then got a, a six to 15 month period of constant reviews, program reviews, milestone reviews, but you get edging all the time closer and closer to something tangible that you're going to implement. And lo and behold, you find things have fallen out of sequence, milestones are being missed, OLAs aren't performing properly between, particularly if it's multi-vendor work, and a point of stress builds. And in that final four to five month period, you find there are more frequent governance meetings, more oversight meetings, more milestone failures. And suddenly the contracts are beginning to come out of the drawer again, which is a phrase that I've uh, been absolutely focused on bringing out as many times as I can. But in my early career, I remember people saying the best place for the contract is in the drawer. It's so untrue in my, in my humble opinion. I think the best place for the contract is a highly visible but really proactive place. Very hard to do, but that's going to lead us, I'm sure, onto what Brooklyn does for a living. Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I was listening to a podcast a few days ago, and using your bow tie analogy, there was a. It, it wasn't. It wasn't about anything we're, we're talking about today, but it was essentially about forgetting about outcomes and goals, which are typically what are in contracts. Right? You want an outcome. You want a goal. It's very easy to lose sight at the beginning of getting excited about that's the outcome and the goal that I want. But the only way you can deliver that is through getting in the day to week to month process detail of the activity that would lead to that as an outcome. Yeah. And people forget the fact that you've got to have the discipline and the rigour to get in and deliver the obligations, well initially write them, the obligations in a contract in the right way, ensure that they add up to the outcome and the goals, and then on a consistent regular basis deliver them day in, day out and the outcome will come, right? The outcome almost looks after itself if you break it down. Um, and it was, like I said, it was a completely different topic. It was a, but they applied it to everything from work to fitness to if you just visualize the goal and then break it down to component parts and then do that on a daily basis, you're more likely to get to the outcome than worrying about the outcome itself. So I, ING Bank have what one of the best chief operating or had, he's, he's stepped down there from the, the role after serving his period, chief operating officer, a chap called Otty Vott, who I used to work with at, at BT. Uh, and Otty is one of the brightest I've worked with and, and, and summarised this challenge very, very well. He said, the, the value of a contract should always be planned back from the future. So the thing you have contracted for, yeah. you, you work backwards from when you've implemented it. All of the other obligations you've got of service development, technology, build, and everything else, you plan forwards. But if you forget to come backwards from the future in terms of the outcome you want, 
then you'll get get into trouble. And the the example they use, they're the very successful HR outsource globally, uh, apart from Australia. And what they've forgotten in Australia was that there would come a tipping point where you've let all of your HR department go because you're moving it into a global service centre. Mm. So they let the people go because that's what the programme plan said, but there was no global service centre ready. So they actually had a bank with no HR department. Um, and that was a public story that ING was saying. The recovery from it was spectacular, but very expensive. So they managed themselves very well, but they wouldn't have got there if they had a more proactive way of managing the entire contract. Got it. Yeah. Final bit on your, where are you at the moment? So what are you doing? What are you working on? What's top of mind for you? I, I'm, I'm having the best fun of my career at the moment. I'm delighted to say. So uh, we, we run a business called Loculus that's involved in interaction, business interaction management, which is workflow, business rules long run events um, and we're working very closely on both customer interactions but also supply chain interactions and by interaction i mean automating an rfp process automating um, a sell side uh, sales process and bid process and actually automating those with proper case management so we're, we're having an awful lot of fun in government and industry areas we just have fun running the business um, but where we are right now doesn't have and our technology wouldn't have that kernel of intelligence that you need for the subject we're talking about. We, we have a very clever knowledge management system. One of our clients is Volkswagen. And if you were to ring Volkswagen and say, I don't know how to make the radio work, yeah. that detail is sat in a KMS, knowledge management system, that's automatically accessed by our platform and you handle the answer correctly first time. As you know, Colin and I were lucky enough to get a demo of... Uh your yeah. platform in Loculus the, the, the other week. Um, Mark kindly arranged that for us. And yeah, it's, it's really what I'd call a really flexible, very powerful platform that is a, a quality of life product, right? That, like you said, it was not going to get to the complex thinking, but the 80% of the work isn't complex thinking. It's process driven workflow where you can augment that with knowledge at the right points by pointing it to the right data source and the right channel management. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a clever technology, but. All of these technologies need the enrichment to address the issues we've been talking about. So KMS is great for customer-led environments where you've documented everything about your product. But when you get into your supply chain and you haven't captured everything about your contracts, how on earth are you going to be as intelligent as you are on the customer interaction side? So supplier interaction is is a huge gap, I think, that organizations can now leverage to in, in my experience, not just save themselves cost, but there's a huge cost avoidance. Yeah. Uh, and it's time to start planning those cost avoidance. Those, those listening to this are probably going to be pleased that the people are still required. They're not quite replaced just people yet. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it makes better use of people, yeah. far better use. It them. takes off the mundane, right? The boring bits of the role and leaves the higher power thinking to the person, right? If you can take out the boring bits, you get a lot more quality by augmenting them that way because they think about the bigger problems more, more of the time than the non-big problems of the boring bits, right? And just the yes. button pushing. There was a standing joke in BT, which I'm sure they won't mind me quoting, which was whenever you have a meeting with British Telecom, a minibus arrives of people. The problem with the minibus arriving is that 70% of your meeting will be a reactive discussion about, and that's why you've got so many people there to explain what happened yeah. in your private network or your wide area network or the public network. Mm. Um, 20% is probably speaking about today's contractual issues. And if you're lucky, 10% of your time goes into a proactive conversation. If we can automate this process, then all of those people, A, there will be fewer people traveling, but B, 70% of the time could be a proactive conversation and 30% is just reflecting on the key points of data about things that may not be performing as well as you want. Yeah. And that means you're going to leverage enormous value out of the joint relationship. That proactive sides where the value comes from right it's not going to come generally in the reactive it, it side. it does and therefore as i said before that, yeah there's a big measure of cost avoidance well where does that come from it's the proactive thinking yeah. and you think well we can take action that stops us having to put more resource in or losing time or mm. not counting a benefit properly and and we've done that and we've implemented that very very well and there's some of the the system integrators that i've worked with who have really woken up to the value they can get out of that so that's a, a, a documented stat that we 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 use in Brooklyn um, that comes from a lot of the big four 
have recognised it and measured it is that if you if you if you do the the draw scenario you mentioned about contracting, so just put it in the draw. There's a they reckon there's a fifteen to thirty percent drop off in value over time on that contract because you just bury your head in the sand, put it in the drawers, you say. But they work out if you get to that proactive thinking, there's fifteen to thirty percent increase in added value that you can get out of it. And when you consider some of these organisations, the what CPOs look at is spend under management, some, right? When you put it all together and the whole supplier or customer landscape, that's a huge figure, right? And you talk yeah. about a thirty point or sixty point swing, mega money, right? It's it's mega money. It's also very expensive to then figure out what you were due. Mm. Because when you get to that point in the life of a contract that you say things aren't working properly, I'm not happy with where I'm at, what was it I should have had? Then you're back to some very expensive colleagues or external colleagues, lawyers, mm. to again translate what they wrote in the contract in the first place and what some of those key defined terms and, and, and clauses actually mean. Um, which is back to my 20 month point. You suddenly find that you become poles apart yeah. and you didn't need to be there. No, I think it's a very good point to get onto the next topic, which is we, we have a, a standing slot that we do each time around just news topics that are generally um, knocking around in the media at the moment. And the first one we've got here is like, it was party gate and cancel culture. And that's very relevant with, with Sue Gray's report dropping about all the parties at 10 Downing Street yesterday. Um, and, and to the point you say people get poles apart and legal. Uh, legal comes in and once it's at that stage it's a bit of a mess right should have just managed it the right way to start with but on the topic of cancel culture so as I simply put cancel culture as an idea around um, the mob decides whether they like or dislike something and if they dislike something whatever that is an individual or a show or whatever tends to be getting cancelled um, that there's, there's there's advocates for it that think it's the voice of the people that it should be done like that and there's also people that are not so keen that the that the the edge case in the most vocal it's a minority but the most vocal minority of society decide what happens to a to an individual and we've seen it I think in the recently you see it, Johnny Depp and Amber Heard's going on at the moment both cancelling each other out in court their careers both seem to be tanking quite a bit we've had this Will Smith Chris Rock situation um, I think Will Smith's got the worst end of that in terms of the career impact all right, so there's that happening, and there was a few few years ago. There's been J.K. Rowling and Ellen DeGeneres, um, and back to the party gate thing. Um, interesting from a consumer side or public side topic. Well, any thoughts on it on that sort of context, and then we'll play it back into how that should work in a, in an organisation. So contractually, what's in the contract to say people mess up? People are going to mess up, right? Companies mess up, people mess up. Should they get cancelled? Should they not? Well, every good contract I've ever, I'd like to think, been involved in allows for and caters for things that go wrong. Yeah. And it's great to flush out the things that go wrong. Yeah. To deny that they're going wrong is a bad thing. And you know, Boris probably, on reflection, would think that's a bad thing. Mm. Uh, Johnny Depp and all the others would probably look, and I guess Wayne Rooney might look and think, oh, that was probably a bad thing. Oh, yeah, the Wagatha Gate yeah. thing that's going on. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. But... Um, again, a, a wise thing that was said to me many years ago, there are three types of people in the world who, who economically get involved in failure, those who can afford it. Uh, if they criticise something, if they break something, they can still afford it. I mm. mean, um, our chap running Tesla, Mr. Musk, can afford to make a bid for Twitter and then afford not to. Not too much skin off his nose. Probably would break my bank account. <laughs> there, there, are, there are those who can't afford to, MPs. Yeah. You know, they get the 70 grand the salary. If they get shot as an MP, then that, that's, that's their income over. Mm. I'd, I would think that's a pretty hard life for them to live. Um, and there's those in the middle who just hide. And I'm sorry to lots of people that I've met in my career, but there are people who have been lucky enough to be with companies for 20, 30 years. The last thing they want is to be criticised to a point that they might lose their career at the point when their pension is looking so good. So you have a problem when you get into a dispute, you get the arrogance of people who can afford. And I've seen that so many times, often from the supply side, but sometimes from a senior level on the client side. Mm -hmm. There are those who can't afford, those who are desperately trying to say, I know what's going wrong, but I'm being swamped by the crowd in the middle, which is typical of what's gone on in Partygate absolutely swamped by a group of people who just want to suppress it and it doesn't matter that much. Yeah. And I think 
if, again, you come back to the subject of how do you get that contract out of the draw? How do you make the reality of what it represents reality for everybody every day, every week, every month? Um, you, you can't do that in that type of culture, but you can do that if there's some automation that's posting it all the time for you. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, I suppose, is what the media does in your examples. You know, it, it, Sorry, speaking personally, I won't say who, who gives a damn generally. I don't personally care that much. I'm more interested in what's happening to the economy, what happens to people who are having a hard time, what's happening in Ukraine. And in the world of acting, I really can't be bothered what Johnny Depp's problem is. But in business, I've got to be bothered. Yeah. I think you, you, you see that, and that, that narrative's playing out. The most people that get spoken to, Joe Public, on that side of, there's a lot bigger things to be talking about. And it seems to a lot of, the silent majority that I'd probably call it are it's just a detractor for what else is going on in the world and I think most of them would rather it just moved on and just wasn't spoken about anymore it's dealt with it's come out you make your decision you vote with your feet or you vote with your yeah. it'll all come out in the wash at the end of the day right did we care about it enough in, 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 the, in, the, in the government sense anyway because we'll vote for someone else and we'll vote conservative out if we did yeah, right exactly. if, if we don't then we won't so at the end of the day we all have choices but for a period of time, we're committed to something. Mm. So whether it's politics, whether it's a court case, whether it's marriage, we are committed for a period of time, even if we wanted not to be in it. And yeah. just in case my wife's watching, I do still wish to be in <laughs> our marriage. But in everything else, there is a length of time that we have to live with it before we've got the choice to break from it, a, a choice that we can afford. And again, in the world of the commercial side, it's no different to running a law case. There's got to come a point where Wayne can't afford his wife's bill any longer. Mm. I would have thought it might be a longer point than the rest of us, but they'll still get to that point. And it's the same in outsourcing and major contracts. You still have those those commercial ve- or those clauses in there that break that condition for certain situations, right? So the rest of it, if you don't, I suppose you don't trigger one of those clauses in a contract. You just have to work through it. That's the relationship where you get together, you proactively manage it. Exactly the word. So we're into that 70, 30 split of life again. If you know the proper status of where you're at in life, you can have a sensible conversation. It's like being a parent, isn't it? You you know damn well what your kids are going to do that is right and wrong. They're going to do these things at some point. (laughs) I did all of them, I think. I had a few more. But the great thing is I had family around me who could talk about it sometimes before I did it. And they certainly picked me up well when I was coming around after doing it. Um, and I've had the same with my lads. And I've, I'm lucky enough to have a grandchild in my life now. And he's two and a half and he already has that look in his eye that he's going to conquer the world. But he's got great manners. You can go out for a meal. He sits there and behaves. He's a wonderful little lad. And that's just come from his parents. And... That parental part, I don't think, is too much different to what we're trying to do in the commercial world. We're actually, you know, we're trying to have a family relationship around with a supplier, with a with a customer, trying to achieve something that's that's different, that gives them some advantage in business. Um, if you're not having the conversations, and particularly if the, if the conversations are bollockings all the time, as opposed to proactive discussions. You're just never going to get a good good relationship, in my view. I find that quite a lot. You can apply a lot of scaled down personal situations, like parenthood, as the example you use there, right? As to, of course, you'd want to uh, nurture and manage your child and make sure that they they find their own way in in, in society and life, but also just give them a bit of guide rails and help at the right time. And it, if you then put that back in the contractual sense, why would you not look after the contract you've signed? Why well, exa- would you not exactly. work to to be the right contractual father figure for it to make sure you get the outcomes, right? Well, if you think in our world of of technology and data in particular, we use family terms, don't we? In data, we talk about parents and child and True, yeah. et cetera, in, in terms of dependencies. And when, well, if you're writing, in my, in my view, very essential things like milestone as well, then you're using the same hierarchy. You, you've got the grandparent at level one, you've got the parent, you've got the child. As you come down, your level of... And, th- and then you don't measure them proactively. Um, if you don't know that... You, if you don't get the warning signs well enough that things are going to cause you to miss some of those milestones, then that's as serious as not noticing that something going wrong for a family member. Yeah. You know, you're not using... You're not able to use your eyes and ears the way that you should. Um, and I, th- I think that's the problem. If you're hiding a contract away, 
you don't see. It's a bit like if you're never home to chat to your family, yeah. you don't see the issues you're that are going absent. on. You're an absent contract manager. <laughs> yeah, I think the thing that's interesting from you know talking about that 20 month point of view, how do you get there? So would have kicked off very nicely. This is where we go. We've got this big vision, and then after a while, things are not going quite well, and you know, oh, well, I know something's not quite right, but it's hidden away. And then over time, it reaches that crescendo of oh, we've got to do something. Then where is the contract? Let's pull it out. Let's go and find. It. And then you're into that case of like lawyers. So if we come back to council culture. Who knows how much has been spent on the government case, how much has been spent by, you know, the Wagatha case, and damaging to people's careers and where they wanted to go. So that vision of where they wanted to get to has all gone. Yeah. And now we're into kind of legal disputes. And that's and I think when you tie that back to supplier and customer relationship, having openness, this is where we're going and this is what we're doing, very clear, good checkpoints, good governance, the way forward is the way to avoid that council culture. Now, whether that would work, Chris Rock and so forth, you know, that was, that was, a, it's like, that, that was a, an immediate action. But you know what? It, was, it had gone on before. It had gone on with his wife before. Yeah. And it was obviously inside, and it was that sudden impact that made him, uh, made, made him react the way he did. So there's always something hiding there. And I think with, you know, if we talk about, you know, Partygate, Leadership. What's going on? What are the rules of the road? And someone, you know, maybe people felt this isn't right, but I can't say that. And well, if we know what the rules of the road are, we know what the contract is, and we know what we're doing, and we're all transparent, you know, oh, there's a there's a, a monthly meeting. This isn't right. We're kind of doing things wrong. That would have gone on track, but it was the repetition that that led to the outcome. And, and as I say, how much money has been spent on the case? And the outcome is not good for, for any party. It's not good for Boris. It's not good for the government. If it's all transparent and you know the contract well enough, or that it's transparent enough for everyone to understand the salient and important parts of the contract, you'd spot the deviation quicker. Yeah. And if you spot the deviation quicker, you'll course correct quicker and you won't end up at the end situation in all the lawyers or at the cancel culture stage, right? So it, there's, you spoke about affordability and people be able to afford the, the situation. But it's still, even if they can afford it, if no one really wins when it gets to that stage, right? If you get to that open yeah. court or in court, even if you end up winning, you generally look at what they got out of it or what it cost them. They haven't won. No they, one they've got the decision, yeah. but they've lost a lot probably. You don't want to be in that situation. You know, you need to, as you say, identify where we are and course correct going forward. Now, obviously, some of them will end up in court. Something might have not been right at the beginning, but you don't want to be there. Um, is, is the, is the, is the, the you, you don't. Um, in, in, in fact, you, know, you, you talk about people winning and losing, but um, it's not necessarily the people who entered into contracts in life who are the winners or the losers. It, it's the vast majority of people beyond them who didn't get the ability to earn their bonus because their systems are rubbish. Mm. They haven't got the new technology that they wanted to be able to hit the targets or hit the customer satisfaction points or the net promoter scores. So the indirect consequence of the contract going wrong on the people that are surrounding it. So hence, living in the future and working backwards in terms of being able to, to ensure you're going to deliver value, it's a great thing to do. But if you haven't got all of the information you need about today and the, and the, near, the near future and the near past, it makes life very difficult. And I, I've often thought... Um, yeah, there are systems in companies that are screaming at me. Yeah. <laughs> if they were people, they'd be screaming at me yeah. to say, I've got the data. I know what's going on. Yeah. But I don't get that information. And, uh, you know, so just taking a contract out of a drawer is, is nowhere near enough. You've got to be able to integrate it. It's back to the family conversation. Mm. You know, it's my, my, my elder son, when um, I had a particular blip in my career, and my confidence fell away. And I'm, off, I'm normally a very confident person. But I went through that strange time when your mind decides it's properly taken over. Mm. <laughs> and the mind took over and I, I got into a very dark place for a couple of weeks. And my son, and I won't repeat on here the language he used, but it was, it was harsh enough to bring me to a, to a halt very quickly. And he pulled me up. He was that screaming system, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you like, that said, whoa, hang on. There's a flag here you need to pay attention to. Now, he did it because I love him, he loves me, it's a great place to be, he, he cared. And it was amazing, and he actually bounced me back, and I had the world of Loculus following that, and life is wonderful. My point is, 
if we can make our contracts more intelligent mm. and we can link to those systems to give them a voice that we can actually respond to, we'll be in a great place. Just automating a contract isn't enough yeah. in the world. Yeah, so what you got to there was kind of key risk indicators after KPIs. Your son was your key risk indicator that just went Absolutely. and went off. The yeah. control was breached, whatever it was, and went, Dad, come on. Yeah, so one of the global banks I worked with, they had 800 vendors in, in the IT space alone. They spent one and a half billion pounds a year. I can't imagine how many programs were running, but there were a lot. Mm. And the vendor manager is trying to look after maybe one fifth uh, using a category management approach. If, if he hasn't got all of that automation or she hasn't got all of that automation, how on earth are they ever going to know what to flag at a, a review meeting? Which is typically a spreadsheet, right? Yeah. It, it, you're, you're asking almost the impossible. And they use some very clever technologies to automate the contracts they had, but it still wasn't talking to me. It's interesting in terms of that hierarchy, that family hierarchy. You know, you've got your direct suppliers and then their suppliers are supplying them and all the way down, everyone's um, increasingly using that supply chain and it's going through generations of the supply chain, many people. So it needs to flow all the way up. And if there's something that's not going right way down the supply chain, and they could be serving multiple uh, customers as well. So having that, as you say, that screaming system that's going, ah, something's not right. And then the ability to understand what, what's underpinning that and do something about it. And an open conversation is, is where, we, where we need to get to. So our second topic was actually, we, we mentioned the gentleman earlier on was Elon Musk. So CEO, I think he's the CEO, isn't he? Of Tesla and SpaceX, billionaire entrepreneur. Um, 44 billion offer for Twitter. And uh, what came out of the last couple of weeks was the, was the due diligence set in was that what was it? it was a 25% discount he was after if they couldn't demonstrate that the actual number of people were actual people and not bots. Yeah. So that was that's the thing that was in the news recently about um, the value or the offer that he made would be dropped by 25% if there wasn't actual people who had the accounts and it was it was robotics. Um, what do you think on that, Colin? Do you think that's fair? I, th I think it's really interesting. I think Rich has raised a very good point about the contract is about driving business value. You want the business value outcomes at the end of it. He wants to buy Twitter. He wants to get his um, social media. Whatever we think about Elon Musk buying Twitter and controlling that social media space. He's already controlling the car market. He's controlling space. And now he's going to have social media. But if he's buying into... Twitter, and that's all being driven by AI and bots, he's not really controlling the social media. And it depends what was in the initial contract. When he signed up, I'm sure some due diligence was done. And if he was told 5% of our customers are bots, and actually we've gone a bit further down the line, and hey, it doesn't feel quite right. I'm thinking it's 25%. He's bought into 5%. So yeah, I think he's, you know, and, and I think also, as we said, he's offered a very good price. Now, shareholder value, what, what's an acceptable value? But, you know, if, if, if he's buying at 5% and it's actually 25%, then, yeah, query the market, see what's going on there. I think being in B2B SaaS and about customer numbers and user accounts that we have to report on as a business, you can, you can see the point. And I think I'll side with him, right? If, you, if you're getting a lot less than you thought you paid the money for, you're going to drop your offer by that, that, that amount, right? Wherever they find the percentage of boxes versus real people. You'd think the offer would drop in that same same twenty five percent of bots is an exceedingly high number, but you look at the traffic going through Twitter, and it's got to be driven by. And there, there, there's some good bots out there, you know, that are putting feeds into Twitter or reading sentiment and doing something with it. So um, I, I, it depends what he wants to do with it. And as you say, he's in a very powerful position with his offer, and it'd be interesting to see how that how that maps out. Thoughts? You, you, you're looking at somebody now who's still trying to figure it all out. <laughs> so I, I occasionally look at Twitter and I think, okay, it's, yeah, it gives me some useful information. Um, I get more interested when I look at the technology that sits behind it. And, and we talk about bots. I mean, in, in the Loculus world, we, we have artificial intelligence. Often people say that's mine, but it's the AI that goes with the platform, not not me being artificial. Mm -hmm. um, our bots, we have we have fairly simple bots. We have very well educated bots. All of the bots, all of the automation, strangely, actually comes back to people. At the end of the day, they can't answer everything. Yeah. 
So what you need is to skill up all your colleagues to work with that automation to work well. And what I find really interesting with Elon Musk is that all the AI bots, everything that goes with it is all about fairly intangible stuff. Social media is fairly intangible to me. Mm. You know, Boris's parties are fairly intangible to me. What's tangible is how many false accounts do they think he had? And that's just cost you 25% because you weren't prepared for it. What was intangible or tangible for Boris? It was his, his escape was there was a red box on the chair and people were able to say he was just passing by because there was a tangible thing there. Mm. In the world of contracting, you know, I think what Elon Musk is trying to do, he's, he's negotiating on the hard fact. I can see that some of it's not correct. That's going to cost you money. How do you argue with that? Yeah. And he's avoiding the intangible. But where does the damage come? If the rest of it was not compliant with legislation, if the rest of it was not compliant with in-country laws, he could buy something that could lose its shareholder value overnight. So he's got to know that when he buys it, it's controlled in a way that's dynamic and up-to-date. But he'll always play his game like a good market trader. I think the man is <laughs> a very Absolutely. wealthy one. Yeah, yeah. Tangible items. I, I would suppose on the other side of the argument, if they come back and there's a high proportion of bots involved, which in this day and age there could well be, I suppose the, the, the angle Twitter would probably take is to demonstrate of why do the bots add value, increase the, the subscribers Absolutely. based on what they do and that they're propping up the number of users, not detracting from it. Yeah. And what he's buying here is he's buying that access to the market. He's not just buying Twitter, but if we look on other social media, you look at the BBC website, they're going and talk, they, they're displaying the, the tweets that are coming out. So, you know, he controls Twitter, he control, controls who can go on there. But more importantly, that then goes out to external feeds and to reputable external feeds um, but I think to the to the point he's he, he may have known this and he you know I'm a very sharp guy he may have seen that opportunity and has gone for it I think we can safely agree he falls into my category of people who can afford to fail there yeah. <laughs> he's got a few more Bob I, I did read I'm not sure how accurate this stamp's going to be actually but I did read that he offered 44 billion and overnight the shares that it was, it was momentary right so but the shares that dropped in SpaceX and Tesla yeah. amounted to like a hundred and thirty billion drop in shareholder value overnight. Obviously, that's cool. They always does. It always comes back, right? But yeah. you've just offered forty four and just wiped out one hundred and thirty or whatever it was over here. I think we'll look back in ten years and twenty years time and go, "How did this happen?" Because the, the, the amount the, the amount of control that's going to happen is 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 very interesting. As you say, satellites are going around the world, controlled by SpaceX and now controlling social media, it's a very, very interesting time. I think Twitter's the really interesting one for me, That the one that it, it obviously has evolved as a technology, but the concept of it never really evolved. Like if you look at all the other social platforms mm. from LinkedIn to Facebook to Instagram to TikTok, they all, they all evolve and add capability and a lot of different things you can do on those platforms now. Twitter has always been just the rawest... It was years before they allowed it to be over like 60 characters or something, wasn't it? It was just a yeah. sentence. And now it's still just a paragraph. There's, there's, there's nothing really it's more to it than that. Yeah. It's, it's in the moment, raw, rent something out, go. And it's, it's done. And it's out there for good. I, I was trapped last night. I was with my daughter. She's 14. And I was saying, do you use Twitter? She goes, no, Dad. We used uh, Snapchat. And I, go, and I was trying to get to that point. Why do you do that? But as you say... Um, there's the other platforms have, have all moved on, and he can see there's that resid there's that value there, and and drive that forward. I don't know how true it was. I did read, or someone was telling me something about Trump when he used to get up in the morning and where he got ready. He had like four or five TVs on different channels, and if no one was talking about him, he'd just bang out a tweet <laughs> to try yeah. to see to see if he could change all the narrative, which I'm sure he could. It's a fascinating world though that exposes everything, doesn't it? I mean, I. As, as Colin well knows, I'm a, I'm a complete petrol head and I love, I love my cars. Um, I, I, I got a new car fairly recently and I decided to put it on the user group through Facebook as it, as it was. Um, and it's, it's really interesting, isn't it? The responses you get. So the first ones I chose to read were the ones that said really nice car. And then yeah. somebody said, but it looks bloody awful with that particular style of wheel on them. <laughs> I don't think it does. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it looks terrible. But I'm thinking, I can't control now the opinions I've invited. Yeah. So you've got to be a particular 
particularly resilience of the person, I mean, like a Trump, mm. that if you've got the power to go out there and, and trigger a, 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 a debate, it must be fascinating to be on, on the receiving end of that debate and not be affected by it. You're going to be a very resilient person yeah. if you've got thousands of people coming back with negative as well as good opinions. And I think that comes back into that council culture and then supply relationships. If you're getting bad press for some reason, the people getting onto the back of that is not good because oh yeah that happened to me and oh yeah and all of a sudden something started and this kind of snowball starts to build that you, you can't do anything again so i think it's even more important that you manage everything that you can and manage it as closely so coming back to the contracts transparency yeah. governance what are we doing good relationships manage that relationship what are we doing before things start to snowball out of control. You know, one guy came back about your car and go, don't like the trim. Another guy, oh, I don't like it. <laughs> Next thing you might, I'm not going to drive that, I'm going to get that's, a new that's, trim. That's the, value, <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the insight piece, isn't it? And that's the information and insight, however it be bad or good. You, you, you speak or you hear from a lot of celebrities, don't read the comments, right? don't go because a lot of it is trolls and it's all very negative and it's all it's more, more often worse than good, right? And you sometimes just have to block that out, but be aware that it's happening. And then, as you said, linking it back into cancel culture, there's a lot. If you look at a lot of these things that happened and a lot of the, the situations that arose, a lot of them start around some commentary on social media or something mm -hmm. happened or something blipped and it got a, an attraction and something started comment on it and it snowballed and it became a lot bigger than it ever was intended to be. I think an example is like the airlines during during lockdown. Oh, don't book there because I think they're going to go. And, oh, i have booked there. I'm going to move mine. And all of a sudden, the airlines are, are under pressure. And, and then they have to come out and say, no, we're all good. We're all solved. Everything's fine. Um, but I think that ties back to, to business impact as well, which is, again, you know, service quality working for the banks. So easy now for people to get on, which, and it's the right thing. Drive the right service. Oh, I'm fed up with X, Y, Z because of X, Y, Z. And all of a sudden, oh, yeah, it happened to me. And you've got to make sure, and I think it comes back to your screaming systems. The screaming system is impacting that user that is then going onto Twitter and, and doing something about it. I think the thing I find really ironic and I kind of like, uh, don't have to explain, it's sort of like a false positive in mind, but us being from a financial background, right? so the banks we've worked in, and especially the investment banks that we've worked in, you used to get to a concept, and it's like influencers, right? You'd have a specific individual that would be referred to as a market mover right someone that would they'd watch for going and try and and buying shares or selling shares on something and people with it like like the instagram models that have got enough of an influencer they were an influencer in their own right and the fact that if they put money on something or took money off something the rest of the market would follow them and it because they got it right beforehand but then it gets to a point that says actually they might not be getting it right they're just so influential what they're doing, everyone's following. And to the Trump point, right, you've got a position of power. You've got to be careful you don't say something that moves, not moves the market, moves the, the economy or moves something because you've stated something. And that's what I think That's what I think Musk gets. And that's what I think that you can start that if you've got enough of an influential mob or group that starts something in that social context, you could move the market. You could move the opinion or, or not whatever the market is in the context you're talking about. And it's the same for the government, isn't it? I mean... The subject is about party gate, but actually the the subject is about the economy. Mm. Yeah, if if you ousted your prime minister, if you ousted your chancellor, at the point that your the economy is tanking and the world is having an economic war, and even worse in Ukraine having a real war, yeah. you're going to knock your markets very quickly. That's going to yeah. affect the pensions. It's going to drive interest rate issues. I mean, something as simple as party hate is yeah. never that simple, is it? No. Something like buying Twitter is never that. Nothing is simple. Yeah. But the areas you want to focus on to get the best out of them yeah. have to be the right areas. Therefore, we've only got so many hours when when we want to be working. It's, it's about the same sort of thing. I spoke to someone earlier uh, about recession, right? It's, how much is it the media say we're in a recession? The mindset is a recession, thus you get in a recession versus stop saying we're in a recession. And maybe people would just keep spending to a degree. Yeah. but And it's that cycle of um, how much are you perpetuating the problem you've got by sort of wallowing in the problem you've got kind of thing. Absolutely. And like I was talking before about lots of parties working together on certain issues. You know, one of the things I've seen in, in most of the organisations I've worked in is you know, we talk, for instance, when you talk about service, you talk about service level agreements, mm. lots of contracts focused on SLAs, 
how many conversations talk about the way different parties work together, the OLAs, the operating level agreements. So typically things are going wrong. It takes forever to figure out why they went wrong. So we're in the world of root cause analysis, we're in the world of who was contracted to do what. Whereas actually all we want is a flag that says, A, something here has gone wrong, so we know very quickly. And then we can look for the consistencies and find out very, very swiftly there's a better way of getting company A to work with company B. It doesn't matter whether you're in technology or you're selling beans on the counter in a retail store. If the shelf isn't there or the lighting isn't working in the store, you can't sell the beans because you have to shut the store for health and safety reasons. So all of these interdependencies uh, yeah, are incredibly important. And I think we as a group, as a society, could do a better job of that in a contractual sense as well. I think a lot of the contracts, the point you made earlier is about XYZ system is outsourced, so the system must deliver. But if you turn those outcomes back to a very personal human base of, well, if the shelf's not there, you can't put the product out. And if the product can't be put out, you can't sell anything. Yeah. And then you put stuff out on the shelves, don't have anything to do, so you've not got a job anymore. Mm-hmm. So ultimately, rather than saying our shelf, person who builds our shelves has got a problem, the articulation is actually a lot bigger snowball effect yeah. onto your organisation than just you've, your shelf manufacturer has got a problem. This is it. And as I said before, there's some poor person whose income, as you just said, is dependent on that that you don't normally think about because you're reacting all the time to... Yeah. To, to an old-fashioned way of running all of that supply chain that you're trying to pull together. If you think of it proactively, you'd think about the people who might lose their job. And I'd say COVID brought that home to us all, didn't it? There were, you know, the, the awful lot of people thought, thank goodness for that, I could work from home. Yeah. But we've forgotten we'll about all the poor people human. who couldn't work. Yeah. I think that thing about the, you know, the outsource, you know, in the past... The, the stores would have had their own people to do that, to fit the shops out. And now, maybe that's that, that's outsourced. You've got to manage that. So whereas before, they could do it themselves and get a, get a good service. You've got to be aware of everything that's going on all the way through that supply chain. You have, and a, and a bit like social media is one of its biggest benefits is you can communicate to a community very, very quickly. Yeah. There's a lot of that during COVID. But the same applies, I think, if you're running a complex supply chain. So if you're a store and you've got a reason you can't operate, you want to tell all of those suppliers very quickly that you've got an issue or you you simply want the ability to broadcast. And there isn't a social media for supply chain as such, but back to our our subject. Yeah, absolutely. And we, we, we agree with that in terms of the concept of the more you... Just a few like blogs I've done earlier this week. Some of it was about... If you've got a strategy, take your suppliers on your strategy because guess what? It's in their interests that you stay in business because you're their customer, right? So to your point earlier, if you've got a problem, let your suppliers know as quick as you can because chances are because they do all diverse different things, your suppliers can probably help you a lot more than you think, even though it's not in the contract. And it's in their interest to make sure that they keep you up because your contract with them stays enduring, right? If everybody knows how they can help the next person and they know that it's their job to do so because there's a piece of paper that says that's their job to do so. Then nine times out of ten, they will. Yeah. Most of the problems come in the world, in my experience, where people just didn't know they were meant to be helping. Yeah, it's not malicious. It's just the level of wasn't wasn't aware. So the m- main topic for today we were talking about, I think we touched on it a lot already, but was about navigating gaps in your operating model when transitioning from pre to post contract. Um, and that we at Brooklyn um, have seen that there's no sort of customer relationship management platform. CRM platforms are great. There's no dispute in there. That um, P2P and S2C platforms are also great. No dispute in what they do pre-contract. But there tends to be, to your bow tie point, this drop-off that is exacerbated through poorly defined operating model and process, but also lack of platform to help bridge that to the topic today, bridge the the gap between that, that, that point in the deal. What do you think that means in the real world, Richard? Um, what issues have you seen over your career and more recent where that, that is that is true? Let's stay with the bow tie analogy for a moment and just stand on the knot in the middle. I I would suggest, and I'd love to get feedback from, from the session and from, I'm always asking my, most of my clients as well, but I would suggest that 30% of contracts can't be found. We sign the things. We don't quite know where 
the original is. We don't quite know where the latest change note is. We haven't been absolutely sure that all the obligations are updated with change, mm. as inevitably happens. The golden source, that's what the knot is. We agreed something, and on the day we agreed it, and every subsequent day we change it, we need to know there's one record. And I think over 30% of contracts in any enterprise won't be in a good state, possibly higher. And I've seen that from the supply side as well. I've, I've seen big organisations having to write to their clients and say, do you have a copy of the contract? Typically when they're coming to renew the contract. So problem number one is there isn't a golden source. Or if there is, you're not sure it's the correct, correct gold. So it's probably a silver source or a, or a bronze source, but it's not golden. Um, and it comes back to my point about expense as well. The more that you've got to try and check and verify that it is the correct gold and source, you're going to spend a lot more money, incur more cost and incur more time. So problem number one is that, and that leads to a number of sub-problems. The, the time to change and impact change in, in contracts is really difficult. And the time just to keep people synchronised, doing the right thing and aware of different obligations. So a, a, a big topic for good old Mr. Musk, if he bought Twitter or even in his general Tesla business, will be security. And in everybody's business and everybody's life nowadays, I, mean, I lost my wallet in London a few weeks ago, unfortunately got it back. But for the hours that you lose it, I'm more worried about will somebody be taking my money yeah. or taking my identity than I was really about the physical thing of the wallet. Now security, I've again, big, big issue I see, that we, we write contracts, the software delivery people know what they need to do. Same in the Loculus world, we've got awesome colleagues, it'll be the same in Brooklyn, they know exactly what they need to do and they do it in the right order. What we might not share, and particularly if we're a bigger enterprise, is the consistent policies. Security is my classic example. People in individual divisions won't be that aware because they have a division called security who's looking after the standards. So. It creates confusion and it creates a pressure that will ultimately result in, in an unhealthy challenge being made. Um, fortunately, protocols and technologies and so forth are very good at the actual security. But my point is, back to what we were saying earlier about things breaking down, the life of a contract is a very complex thing. And it has obligations within it that are specific to Colin, to Richard, to Nick. But it has obligations in it that are specific to all of us and people outside of the room as well. Mm -hmm. And the, that's the second issue I find, communication. Uh, communication is very, very poor in the world of contracts. So when you sign a contract, people send out comms saying, fantastic, we've signed a contract. Very rarely does it say precisely what it's going to make that different and how your life will become better or how your life will change. Or so that's, how, that's how we look at it from a congratulations, you've signed a deal. But we, all, we also look at it on the basis of congratulations, you've signed a contract, which is the birth of your relationship, right? It's the birth of your your deal together, your, your future yeah. partnership. And there's a level of, I think, stigma or, or, or emotional worry when people say, oh, we'll refer to the contract. Because anyone who says that to me, or when I hear that, it, it feels to me, because you've not digitised your contract and not living in it in a day-to-day -day basis and understand all the component parts, to your point, you're referring to something in a drawer. Because you've made it sound like, let's refer to the contract. So you shouldn't have to say that if you're already living out the structure of the contract anyway and you know where that is because you wouldn't say it in that way because it's next to you in obligations and, and, and detail in a system. Um and when you say that, I think to your point about 30%, I, I, I could well believe that it's easily as much as 30%. But I think the, the, the far bigger percentage after that would be a band that's about, we've got what we initially signed on day one, but that has changed so much in the last 90, 120, 365, 720 days that it's just not representative of what we're doing now. So where's the diff, basically? Absolutely, and the diff is the perfect world. So if I go back again to my bow tie, but I'm going to change the wings now. So, so if you've got the wings as a physical picture in your mind of two lines drawing together into the knot in the middle of the bow tie, well, let's get rid of the wings and put two wheels there. Mm. So the golden source is not a static thing, particularly if you're in a regulated industry. Mm. The policies will change all the time. And back to my example of one of the banks, you have 800 companies. So multiply that by 
the number of colleagues in those companies who will be working with your bank. You've got thousands of people that you need to tell that a policy has changed. Not, not an easy thing to do and not an easy thing to put an audit trail behind proving that you've done. But equally on the other side, what's happening there? So we, we've not talked about a wheel on that side, a life cycle. Now there's a commercial life cycle that is taking place that's inextricably linked to this golden source, which is evolving. And the commercial life cycle is everything we've spoken about. It's everybody being up to speed with the obligations that sit in the contract, seeing them as friendly things that are helping them like my lads did with me. They're there to help you along in life. Understanding and being able to understand with plenty of time to respond to incidents that might, your systems might tell you about, but the systems haven't been talking to you. They're screaming, but you're not hearing them. Integrating all of that in the commercial life cycle and then recognize when you need to make change, you're handing over through the knot to the, the golden source, the legal life cycle. Where we've implemented that in the last five years, this, the, the cost savings have been dramatic. But what's been even more dramatic is that proactive way of working. Companies are now working far better together. There are fewer disputes, there are fewer contentious issues taking place. Most importantly, there are fewer people involved. And that's been one of the most striking things to me. You know, the, it's a bit like family, I suppose. Yeah, the bigger it is, I imagine the more complex it is to get from A to B, to do things, to communicate. Um, I'm lucky there are four wonderful people. Well, three. I'll save the judgment on myself. <laughs> three other wonderful people in my family. It's easy to move around. Cars are designed for us and so forth. So the smaller the teams that are engaging, the more proactive, the high, more highly performant they're going to be. If everybody's looking for the systems and trying to get the data out of the systems and put it all into PowerPoint decks once a month to look backwards at what's happened, which is your standard supplier governance meeting that I'm used to, you're going to have an awful lot of people there, back to the joke about BT and the minibus. That's why there are an awful lot of people going. And you don't make much proactive progress in life. And that's the cottage industry, right? And that's the hamster wheel that you can easily get on, which is just Absolutely. armies of people to explain what should be effort that's put elsewhere, basically. Yeah. So, I mean, even in the world of Loculus, you know, we, we're a perfectly formed company with 70-odd colleagues in, in there. There are fewer colleagues involved with each customer because we're actually running the machine in a very coordinated way. So it's quicker to get to value. It's quicker to respond to problems. It's less expensive, and therefore better for the bottom line, better for the colleagues because they share in our bottom line in being able to operate and grow the business. And I, th I think that's really important. It's back to what we were saying about the, the, the sort of supermarket context earlier. You know, if you put all of the suppliers for one supermarket, or even, even you, they use the banking analogy. When, mm -hmm. when I was in banking uh, uh, with Barclays, we worked out how many suppliers looked after one physical branch. I was amazed because it was 29. <laughs> and if any one of those failed, like the utility mm -hmm. company, you can't open the branch. <laughs> Yeah. Um, if someone breaks a window overnight and you've got nobody to fix it, you can't, you can't open the branch because there's dangerous glass in the window, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's remarkable how interdependent these things mm -hmm. are. So it's, in, my, in my world of commercial nowadays, when you said, where are those challenges sitting beyond communication, sits that thing that we've got such a diverse ecosystem. It's been like Twitter, there must be millions, billions of different interest groups in the world of Twitter or Facebook or whatever. But ultimately, they'll all come together if you get something like a global pandemic, or if you're a supermarket, something like a, a, a total power failure. Mm -hmm. You can you want a mechanism to bring them all really back together nice. into yeah. one conversation very, very quickly. So Colin, you've done a lot with operating models. Um, what do you think is key about it? We talked about in a system context there, a lot of uh, being able to put your uh, hands on the contract in a digital sense and breaking up that contract. What do you think is key about sort of processes and operating models of teams that are involved together that underpin that? What do you, what do you, what do you see as the most or the more successful organisations have done with their operating model? Or I, I think clarity to begin with clear operating model. So if you layer on that diversity of services without a clear operating model, you're just stacking on 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 chaos. Who I hey, well the service isn't quite right and I've got twenty nine people serving this bank branch and something goes wrong. 
whether it's with the service at the time or forward looking and working together, if you've got or not, you need to have a clear operating model. Who's doing what? So I think the first thing is clear governance about who owns what part of the relationship. And then the other thing about the um, the complexity of when these, you know, your, your left-hand side of the bow tie, when these contracts are put together, lots of different groups putting them together. Now they're coming down to that knot. Now there's going to be sensitive information within the contract. So you can't just go, hey, everyone, there's the whole contract. So you need to share you know, need to know basis. What do you need to know? So be very clear. So have a clear operating model. Make sure people understand their roles, responsibilities. System is screaming. Who do I need to scream at? It could be screaming into the ecosystem. But if no one's picking it up, they they don't know. Um, and I think the best transformational change that you know I've I've seen working with multiple organisations over the time is when you get that partnership. You get the groups working together. So. One of the things that I always try and do is have a workshop, get everyone around the table. This is the vision. This is where we're going to. So everyone understands that big picture of where we're going to. They don't need to understand all the nuances of the contract that underpins where we're going. Here's, you know, here's the, here's our big system integrator. They're going to be leading the process and we're working with the, the parties that are working to put that in place. But everyone's there. So show that collaboration, show that partnership. And here's the governance. Here's how we're going to run it. And I think have that openness and transparency about how we're going to do that. And I think to the to the point that you raised, the more that we can bring out what is in the contracts and not hidden away in a drawer, digitize it in some way, and then make sure that that process going forward is as smooth as possible you're spending time on value conversations. You're spending time on transformational change. You're spending time on the business value that you articulated early on. And you're not, everyone's going, oh, why are we here? What are we doing? Oh, and, and not to the, you know, why am I here? You know, everyone knows why they're here. And with that governance, you can you can take it away and bring it back together and it, and it, and it works better and be open. So workshops, whether, you know, you have to go away, Every month we go away, every quarter we have a steer code. Whatever it is, make sure you drive through that change. And if there is a system that's screaming, who needs to know? I, I know about it. So I think for me, we talked about early on, there, there, is, a, there, there is definitely a gap. Lots of complexity in the, in the contracts that are put together and it's, it's not shared. So I've seen circumstances where, hey, we're the change program that's implementing the contract that's been put in. I don't even know what's in there. Well, how can you deliver success on the back of that if you don't know what you're obliged to do? And that leads to friction between the customer that's going, oh, I'm, yeah, you're obliged to do this, are we? Ah, oh. so you've got to be very clear on who's doing what, the obligations, and then track it track it through. To, to your point that Richard made earlier around, um, it's about not being malicious at all, it's about not, being, not knowing. There's been multiple things in my career that I consistently come back to all different roles all different jobs but a lot of the time it comes down to the basics being done right and you mentioned like operating models you mentioned process you mentioned clarity and responsibilities I think even a lot of teams that I see that that potentially haven't sat down and just ever ever worked out the end to end of something right mm-hmm. the end to end of a process and then uh, and then then broke it up into its sub-process parts and at least gone well you own that bit right I'm not going to tell you how to do your job but you own that chunk of the the life cycle I own this chunk is there any gaps in the middle of it right is that chunk to that chunk is that the the ones that should be next to each other and hand off accordingly because the the problems that I see quite a lot are at that basic level which is you've poorly defined something you've got 10 process steps to something and You've got seven and eight are missing. So <laughs> don't be surprised that it falls down when you get to that part of the process because you've not defined it. Um, I think back to the point I'm making about basics is, is, is time and time again I come back to what did the contract say? Was that a good written obligation? Was it acceptable to be put into the contract and then signed off? And then is it deliverable? If you have that kind of stream or thread running through it from pre to post, you, you kind of stop this problem from happening. You do provide it, and there's one provided that I would throw in there that is often forgotten about, I think, even even right now today. People still talk about the major contracts in their in their supply chain and then the long tail. So when yeah. I was talking about the bank earlier and seven to 800 suppliers, 
600 of those will fit in what the industry will call the long tail. And some can be very, very small, like Loculus, like Brooklyn, relatively speaking, small organisations. But in this day and age of fintech technology, for instance, they are some of the most important that you've got. They're providing the AI or the bots that enable you to transfer funds, that enable you to, to deal in a new way in the market. There may be the technology that actually contains all of your contract. If this went wrong, it's pretty important to your business. So no longer can you say, I've got five outsourcers and I spend 80% of my time making sure they're looking after my enterprise operating model correctly. You've now got to be consistent across just about every supplier. Mm. And it even works in the retail world. They'll still have their major suppliers and their infrastructure providers. But when pandemic came along, which was the most important, the people who had gel and the people who had masks, who were tiny little companies Mm -hmm. that they had to rely on very, very quickly to scale up. So what we're talking about in terms of process and automation and so on, it depends, its importance depends now on how it's spread across the entire supply chain, not just the central part, because the value may come from something that's quite small. And no way if you're in the... um, any, for instance, major bank, let's just say with those guys for a minute, can you afford to have vendor management across every single supplier in the seven or 800 that you've got? But but very interestingly, the, the regulator is also aware that they need to manage it. You Absolutely. can't, and, and yeah. the, the, the security threats that we saw late last year, if you t- attack one of those suppliers and it goes, you know, it, it, you need to manage, you need to know, one, you need to know who they are, yeah. You need to tier them. How, who am I going to spend my time with? Yeah. You need to touch all of them, and you need a way of talking to them all. So to that point about who are my suppliers? What do they supply me with? And why? And then you come into the cost bit, which is at the end. What, do I actually need this? But I think that the, the security threat and the ability to work across that is, is key. Know who they are, who are the contacts, Absolutely. have that touch point. And then, the, as I say, the regulators, and as we know in the financial sector, it, yeah, it, you've got to know who, who is providing your services all the way through, even down to the, 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 the tail there. I think the supplier management discipline is quite um, a sub unoptimized, right? So it's, there's no standardization around supplier management, right? So we've been looking to help try and change that with vendor ops, et cetera, and give it sort of a repeatable standard definition. But I think it, it's an industry that, it almost draws me back to the old days of when HR was called personnel, right? It's like, oh, it's about people. It's HR's job. Or it's personnel's job because it's about people. And over time, it gets to the point where it goes, no, culturally, you need to be able to manage people and be able to be a, 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 a people-aware person and aware of who you're managing. I think the same thing applies to a lot of disciplines today and, and supply management, which is you're not going to get a vendor manager for every contract, Right. You've got to understand and your organization needs to put forward its standard blueprint of repeatable vendor management or supplier management or customer management. And you expect everyone to follow that, that guidance and those policies in the, in the, the best way that they can, because it needs to be part of the frontline job. It, it, it needs to be day to day. We do a lot of people talking about a lot of risk management. And if you leave it up to risk managers, it's typically something that's crystallized. It's too late or it's a near miss by the time it gets to a risk manager because the risk managers don't work in the front line. They're not in the coal face, right? If, if you get that information down to the coal face and that structure and that software augmented help next to the person that's at the coal face that says, I think something's going a bit wrong here. You might want to look at it in this context, back to your Loculus point about giving me the knowledge, then you empower that person to go, oh, yeah, okay, well, let's think, head it off. On that personnel HR thing, you know, before this was all um, put through the automation and process, you didn't know what was going on. But now there's some very good systems out there that, and, you know, from a basic system, an HR system, you can go in there. We know who they are. We know what their contract is. But more importantly, they can flag up when they, they when then there's issues. You know, whistleblowing. Ah, yeah, I can call that out. And if you're seeing a hot spot, whoa. So ah, something's not right over there. Maybe Boris could have done it with Partygate. Hey, or one of the controllers. Cause something's not quite right. I'm getting loads of complaints about parties on a Thursday. Whoa. Yeah. yeah, that's not right. Yeah. But so that we've certainly seen, it, as you say, we've seen it in, in other systems. As you say, um, vendor management, contract lifecycle management, there is a huge, there's a great opportunity here. 
There, there, there is. And, and to give them a good view, I mean, my final analogy almost on that subject would be, you know, if, if you go to North Wales and you want a fantastic view, go to the top of Snowdon. But if there's a railway that will take me there, as opposed to having to do the hard yards of walking up, I'll probably use yeah. that, to be frank. My point is, when a contract's been signed, many people will arrive at the bid manager's front door if you're on the supply side or the vendor management's desk if you're on the on the buy side. Mm -hmm. And they say, can you tell me about this, this and this? And it'll take them forever to wade through hundreds of pages to extract that information. And when I say forever, that's where that three months delay we spoke about near the, the start of this discussion comes from in setting these things yeah. up. People are trying to break out the information, at which point many have lost interest. Well, and, and there's some crystal clear things in, in most contracts. You know, you've got your, these are the milestones yeah. we're aiming to hit. Exactly. So, the, so the people that ask for that booth, but they're expecting that to be done. The people yeah. that are going to be delivering that, maybe they're not fully aware. And yeah. no, and then on, on the service side, your SLAs, your OLAs, and, and so yeah, forth. So, but, so back to our, my point earlier about communication. Quite often people make a big shout on day one, we've signed a great contract between two companies, and that's the end of it. Day two, Stop. it should be, and this is what it means for you, and yeah. this is what it means for you, and you start those proactive debates, and the information is readily available. Now, I, I was speaking only last week to somebody who said, yes, but that's not easy to do. And and the, the one thing I will say is we took, only a couple of months ago between us, and I've got to get this out here, we took one of the most complex contracts I've ever seen in size, 80 schedules. How many hundreds? Over a thousand pages, I think. Yeah. Ridiculous size. And within a working day, that was in an automated form. At least a form good enough to start a, a structured communication. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you tell me where else you can do that in, in industry at the moment. I mean, that's such a major advantage. So operating model, everything we've spoken about is, is true, I think. But it's not as good as it can be if your communications isn't awesome. And I'll be really happy the day we've got marketing really focused on day two communications around a new contract, because well, that, that's where I think. Yeah, I think yes. Yeah, operating model, best practices, guide rails, yeah. uh, and, and, and as you say, what is it on day two? What is it on month two? What is it on year? Two? You know, and, and and if you can put those processes and governance in place, then it's it, you, well, you're, giving, you're giving people the train ride up soon. Oh, yeah. Yeah. On, on day two, <laughs> there's the view. This is what it's all about. There's a lovely view, yeah. yeah. And I think the people that have gone into that, of designing that contract and you've gone into the knot, things change. As we you talked about, things change. They need to be reflected. Otherwise, people may be thinking pre-contract, oh, it's, no, it's changed. Oh, did it? I didn't know it changed. Oh, and again, you, you need to be very clear on what, and changing for the right reason, because no one can predict the, the future. Change for the right reason, and when, and when and when you come to renew or relet that particular contract, it's awfully embarrassing if you spend a year getting ready, which is typical for a major complex outsourced contract, let's say, and then you find that your preparation has been against incorrect yeah. obligations, terms, or policies, because you hadn't conformed to the agreements properly during the life of change yeah. since it was first signed, and that wouldn't be rare in major PLCs, I would say. So yeah, there, there are lots of things around an operating model. That well, you that, can that leads improve. to frustration. And I, one of them, when working with one of the banks, I took on a, an account and I took on working with a, a supplier of, of data centers and went along to the first meeting. And I knew we'd had some incidents the previous month and came along and said, everything's green. Well, everything's not green because I know this. Yeah, but that's not in the contract. I didn't know that. Um, and... We ended up every month they'd come. It's green. It's green. It's green. It's not green. Um, and we actually went. We ended up at an RFP. So it wasn't good for for, for us. We were frustrated that the, the you know, what we felt was misrepresented. Maybe that wasn't in the in the SLAs or the clauses of or, of the contract. And the contract had changed. Um, but we were frustrated. The supplier was frustrated. We end up going to a um, uh, an RFP. A lot of time went into that. The the out, and the outcome was was not good for both parties, but it's not having not having that clarity. We had we had we had some governance in place, but it was you know, I don't, you know you pulling together those contracts was very hard. Yeah. If you look at the point we're talking about around transparency and communication, and you uh, bad analogy probably, but you look at it to a, a, a football game, right? You you get the guy that's on the bench is watching the game play out, 
and that more often than not, when they get on the field, which is the next stage, so day two of the contract signing, if they've watched the game and been informed enough, right communication and what's coming forward, they can get stuck in. And then the next shift, right? So where you've got the guys on the field that are fatigued from the negotiation, etc. As long as you've got the right points that says, right, team two, get ready. We think it's coming. We think we're going to sign it. This is all the key salient parts. These are the component parts through some software. When they're done, they're the next team, they're the next shift, right? They're mm-hmm. energised, fired up, they carry their bit, and then there'll be the third bit, right, that they do. And as long as you can make that comms carry on, you avoid that trough or lag, as you put it, and the drop-off. Yeah, it's incredibly important. And I, I think, yeah, when, when you're working with each of those shifts, what is it I'm asking them to talk about? Well, certainly in the work I was doing with guys at NatWest, we got to a very good place that we were asking, first of all, we banned Amber. So you're talking about things oh, being yeah. green. Red or green, yeah. Yeah. Because everything was amber, no doubt. Well, am- <laughs> am- amber is because the systems haven't told me yet. The data isn't there yet. I'm not sure yet. It might be yet. But yeah. we, haven't, we, haven't a, we haven't apportioned success or blame yet. Mm. So we banned that. We said that we, we want to know about the reds. Now, in our world of proactive, automated world, the reds we should know about before we get to a meeting. We know what they were. We knew fairly quickly. We know what the resolution was. We know what any conflict was. We can just go, yes, we know about those, rather than spending 70% of the time talking about the darn reds. What we want to know with green is, why are they green? Why are we being successful? The contract's clearly working if it's Mm. green. Or how close is the green to going red? Mm. Because Amber's been banned. That's a proactive discussion. That's about, how am I going to drive value forward? So if my program is is green, why is it green? Did you... Are you charging me too much? Did you way overestimate this thing? Or are you charging me? Am I, should I now be understanding that I'm paying at a very high day rate because you put geniuses on it who are delivering it much faster? And are you going to change them for the next deal? Exactly. I will understand my value. I won't be looking at the rate cards. I won't be looking at an invoice saying, this seems expensive. That's, a, that's an amber conversation. So I think it's very interesting in the world of being proactive. My, my personal poll before my career gets completely washed up would be, ban amber then I know being successful is it'll be a very good place to be on that note um, I'm sure we can talk for another two hours at least um, any final thoughts gentlemen my, I, my, my mind's still polarised on a chap who can afford 44 billion to buy something I, I'm thinking how many cars I could buy to do that but my final thought would be if I bought any more cars I'd probably need my own system to actually control um, I got a wonderful email on my way down today from Volkswagen Audi Group telling me that my car that isn't my car um, is due for a service. It's my wife's car, um, but they think it's my car and they think it's my car. And they took my first name, which I don't use. I use my second name. So they, A, it winds me up that they call me Howard, not Richard. Secondly, they said it's my car. It's not my car. Which at this point, I'm thinking, folks running an Audi group, if you pardon my French, can't give a shit really about me as the customer. They just want the revenue for the service. And then the third thing is, would you book it yourself? <laughs> God, do you do anything for your money? Mm. That's the reaction I had to the single email that came through. Now, actually, when we're talking about contracts and back to the world of what Loculus does as well, where we're going with many of our customers is to say, you've got a contract when you sell a car, but it's not just about that, it's about the finance of the car. There's a duty of care to the person who's taken the finance out. There's a duty of care written by the warranty that applies to the vehicle when there's a fault with the vehicle and you want to know it's a single person. And Nick, you mentioned CRM earlier. Mm. I would argue having your supply interaction management all contained logically and automated in one place allows you to have a very different CRM world. They would know I'm Richard. They would know it's Caroline's car. They would say, we've got these days when we might be able to book in. In fact, if they wanted to use even better technology and I'd allowed them access to my diary, they could say, I can see you're free on certain days. Would that be a good day to book it in? They could do that, and they could do that this year. Now, I'm picking on Volkswagen Audi Group because I've spent a lot of money with them, but I like them a lot because they're one of my customers as well. And we've had similar conversations That, to me, I believe, is a world we will be at in 10 years' time. If you imagine that world, and to my point of success earlier, let's come back to today, imagine how you got there if you didn't have a clue where all the contracts are and how they interrelate. Yeah, and the points you make, make, they would have, along that journey, found out those 
it, those bits of information before sending you that email. So they would have already yeah. known that you was buying it for your your wife. Yeah. They'd yeah. already known that you referred referred to as Richard rather than Howard, yeah. right? And if they'd have managed to integrate those systems and that data point and that KMS in the right way, then you'd have ended up with a lot better experience on your email. No doubt. And that's why I'm jealous of Elon Musk because he can afford to have people working for him. We take that problem away. <laughs> Dare I say, if you had 44 billion, you'd switch back to planes rather than cars? Probably. <laughs> well, I, I, think, I, I think to the point, though, it's, it's, it's very exciting times. Very exciting very times. Because you, 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 you've got that vision of seeing that, that go on there. And then to your point, we, we're, we're losing information. All this work's going on, that yeah. bow tie, people putting stuff in a drawer. That information is all good. Everyone's doing great work. So, you know, the, the systems at the front end of the process are great. Yeah. They're capturing all this. Now, if we can take that and do something with it and automate it with governance and standard operating procedures. We've seen some great work with with one of our customers, Danske Bank. You know, they had a challenge, they had to get this in place, standard operating procedures in place, follow those through, regulatory challenges sorted. But now they're becoming a center of excellence for vendor engagement and vendor management. And it's it's great to see. So I think your your vision of seeing that that that, that really is transformational change. I'm, ex- I'm really excited to talk about the Loculus link up, the automation, yeah. the workflow. The world is changing. And I think this, this area um, with vendor ops mm-hmm. driving this through is hugely exciting. Great concept just comes to my mind. So we've been talking about drawers and it gives that physical connotation of being in a drawer, but there are more digital drawers than there are physical drawers, right? And if you can connect those digital drawers, then yeah, abso- absolutely that's the value, that's right? And- and, and for those who might be nice enough to have listened to us droning on, there's th- th- three old guys having a conversation about how you improve the world. It's very seriously. I mean, up, up front, I talked about cost reduction and we talked about cost avoidance. Now, for one of the clients I've worked with in the last five years, the upside to their profitability was amazing. And it was single digits, but it was closer to 10 than it was to zero in terms of profitability improvement through simply being able to execute what they contracted to do better. So they've got cost benefits, they've got cost avoidance, they've got risk benefits, but they even improved profitability. I still believe even in the world of a supermarket, in the world of a car manufacturer, in any world, you can actually drive more profit. And it's quite acceptable profit because you're just being more efficient. Um, so the, yeah, this well, subject I'm has sorry, got a long way to go. go. It's profit from customer service, customer excellence, customer delight. and customer delight. Yeah, yeah that that comes. Yeah, that comes from what we're talking about. On that note, I've chased you both around enough to get you on this podcast today. So thank you, gentlemen, for joining me. Um, that was today's episode of the Bridge. Um, yes, thank you. To keep up with the latest vendor ops news, subscribe here and follow us on LinkedIn. Links in the description below.